Well, according to Webster's Dictionary, a critic is a person who expresses a reasoned opinion on any matter, especially involving a judgment of its value, truth, righteousness, beauty, or technique. A critic provides criticism, which usually means a remark or comment that expresses disapproval. But it can also refer to, a, to, an act, to the activity of making judgments or providing opinions about the qualities of books and movies and different things. Oftentimes when we think of a critic, oftentimes we think of a critic, we, oftentimes uh, we think of it in a negative way. And, uh, or how, how a critic oftentimes is, is often criticizing and, and sometimes it just, it just kind of wears on us. And yet, how many of us, maybe even this week, when we go to purchase a product, where do we go before we purchase it oftentimes, if we're going to buy it online? We oftentimes go to the review. I know sometimes if I'm looking at something, I, you know, you can go to uh, uh, different sites to get reviews, and uh, so oftentimes I'll go to Amazon, because oftentimes there's thousands of reviews. And oftentimes these reviews are simply someone offering criticism or critique of a certain product. Oftentimes it's very positive, other times it can be very negative. Oftentimes it's not the product, it's the service of getting the product. And so, in, the, in, in that example, we're looking for a positive critique, something that's going to help us, something that's going to benefit us. But we all probably have examples in our lives, and hopefully that example isn't sitting next to you today, of those who like to offer their critique on everything, including critique on how you live, how you eat, how you do your job, and so on. Some of their critique may, may not be bad. Uh, it's just sometimes it's it takes a little while for some of us, like myself, to take it in. It's helpful. It can be helpful. But when all this person does is critique and offer criticism, it can sometimes wear on us. But the point today is that, that criticism isn't always bad, but it, it can also be helpful uh, to our lives. I mean, you could say that the preacher, the preacher of Ecclesiastes, he's a critic of his day. And I would say after my study of the last couple weeks, reflecting upon this passage that we'll be looking at, he's a critic as well of our day. In his book, Beyond Futility, a commentary on Ecclesiastes, David Hubbard, he makes this observation about the preacher. He says this, he says, his society needed what he had to say. They had overvalued wisdom, almost to the point of using it to control God, they had overprized pleasure, hoping by it to find life's true meaning. They had perverted justice by diminishing the rights of the poor and the oppressed. And they had overestimated their freedom to make life-shaking decisions by ignoring the mystery of God's ways. A futile way of life was that the, what the preacher accused them of living. With his sharp pen, he had pricked the balloons of their hollow hopes." So far, the preacher has addressed a number of areas within society, but now he drops by the temple to offer critique. As Derek Kidner points out, he says here that the writer's target here in this passage, the writer's target here is the well-meaning person who likes a good sing and turns up cheerfully enough to church, but who listens with half an ear and never quite gets around to what he has volunteered to do for God. Such a man has forgotten where and who he is, above all, who God is. The preacher will be offering us today a critique of our attitude and words when it comes to worshiping the true God. He wants to make sure that we enter into, engage in, and exit worship properly. Let us not leave worship in a worse condition than when we came in. Our passage this morning is in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. If, it will be on the screen, but if you'd like to look at it yourself, there's Bibles in the pew there. And if you need a Bible and don't own one, feel free to take that with you. Uh, but we'll be in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. I'm going to read through the passage, and then after I read through the passage, we're then going to kind of walk through it and kind of break it down a little bit. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To draw, to draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools. 
for they do not know what they are, that they are doing, that they are doing evil. Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God, for God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. For a dream comes with much busyness and a fool's voice with many words. When you vow a vow to God, do not delay paying it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow, that you should vow and not pay. Let not your mouth lead you into sin, and do not say before the messenger that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? For when, in dream, when dreams increase and words grow many, there is vanity, but God is the one you must fear. And so, looking at this passage, broken it down into three points, and the first point is that properly, we need to be about properly entering worship. And he starts right from the get-go with, guard your steps. Watch your step when you go to the house of God. What he's saying is, is folks, as, as, we, as we enter into it, now, at this point in time, they're entering into, into the temple. It's a little different for us. Yes, we enter into this place of worship, but we've come to recognize, too, that worship is not a, a, a Sunday morning thing, but it's a day in and day out thing for each and every one of us. So here he is quickly saying, folks, slow down, stop. And give God the proper reverence and respect before you enter into this place. Draw near to, draw, to, to draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they are doing evil. So again, this listen there, is, in, in the Hebrew, it's, it's a double, it has a kind of a double meaning, as it oftentimes it does in English, and that is the fact that it's pay attention and obey. So it's just not listening to gather information in our brains, but we need to be considering how do I obey what is being presented to me. I like what uh, uh, a commentary uh, person by his last name was Towner. He says, he says, the preacher knew that in the presence of God, a person's heart, ears, and mouth are all under scrutiny. Each person needs to be chastened by the humility of being an earthling, subject to a heavenly sovereign who cannot be manipulated by words. And so as you, as you think about that, to draw near, to listen, it's better than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know what they're, that they are doing evil. In a sense, he's confronting the system of the day where people are simply, they've got their sacrifices, they've got this, they've got their rituals, they're walking in, they're doing their thing, but where's their heart? Their heart is not there. Their heart is not in it. And so that's, again, he's wanting us to reflect. He's wanting us to consider. He's wanting us to think. And in a sense, as, I, as, as, you, as you think about the Old Testament and then as you think about Christ, you begin to realize that from, from throughout Scripture, from the prophets, the sages alike, they've always warned about worship without serious intention. And obedience. And that where there's not serious intention and obedience, it's dangerous. It's foolish. Could we say it's vanity? Do we want to be about worshiping God in vain? No. When I thought about this, I thought about King Saul. We know he wasn't the greatest king. But we find in 1 Samuel 15, this is after, you know, he's defeated uh, a certain group, and after defeating, he was told to, to wipe everything out. And what's he do? He holds back the king, he holds back the animals. Samuel comes on the scene, and he's hearing, he's hearing sheep, and he's hearing livestock, and he's kind of going, uh, I'm picking up disobedience here. And he calls Saul out. And what does he communicate in 1 Samuel 15, 22? He says, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. John MacArthur in his book, The Ultimate Priority, he makes this statement. He says, music and liturgy can assist or express a worshiping heart, but they cannot make a non-worshiping heart into a worshiping one. The danger is that 
that they can give a non-worshipping heart the sense of having worshipped. So the crucial factor in worship in the church is not the form of worship, but here it is, the state of the hearts of the saints. If our corporate worship isn't the expression of our individual worshiping lives, it is unacceptable. If you think you can live any way you want and then go to church on Sunday morning and turn on worship with the saints, you're wrong. You know, it's interesting, in Matthew, you don't have to turn there, I'll turn there real quick, but in Matthew 15, is Jesus not confronting the same? Where he says in Matthew 15, 8 through 9, he says, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain, in vain do they worship me. Mm. And you know who he's quoting? He's quoting Isaiah. So we see that this is not just a problem of our day. It wasn't just a problem in, in Saul's day. But now we have Isaiah. Now we have Jesus. So we realize that this is across the board. This is where we tend to go. We tend to want to just fall into the ritual of things, the going through the motions of things. And, and here the preacher is saying, no, watch your step. Guard your step. Be careful. The worship of God is the highest ministry of the church and must come from devoted hearts and yielded wills. So a couple questions. Are we coming before God in humility, recognizing His majesty and His right to our lives, seeking His guidance and listening to His words? This study has, the conviction of this study in my own personal life has grown and when I first read it, you know, I'm kind of doing my study and I'm looking things over, but <laughs> the Holy Spirit has just been kind of going, yeah, there's, there's a spot, there's a spot. How, how are you entering the day, Matt? How are you entering this time, Matt? Or are we supposing that offerings, prayer, and worship can be a substitute for, God, for a God-ordered life? That, you know, I can live my life the way I want to Monday through Saturday, and then Sunday I'll, I'll get everything right, but then I go right back. Are we consciously or unconsciously trying to bribe God? So, so our approach to God needs to be with reverence. It needs to come with humility. It needs to come with submission, a sense of which, God, I want to just, I want to surrender my life to you today, each and every day. And a sense of, too, of if there's a need for, for repentance, if there's, uh, I, I need to come with God with a contrite heart and each day submit. So we want to be about guarding our steps, watching our steps. We want to be about listening and, and not offering sacrifice of fools. We want to make sure that our heart is in it. And so we want to be properly entering into worship. Secondly, we want it to be about properly engaging in worship. And in this passage, there's two areas of which are observed. First, verses 2 and 3. Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth, therefore let your words be few. For a dream comes with much busyness and a fool's voice with many words. So let your words be few there. It would, in, it would, it would seem to indicate that what he's talking about is prayer. And, and if you think about it, it you just wonder if, again, I, as I've studied this passage, I, I found a number of times when Jesus is, is reiterating something to his disciples or to those of whom he is teaching, and I just begin to wonder, is, is this passage on his mind as he's giving forth some teaching? Because in Matthew 6, 7, he's telling his disciples, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. And so again, was there some form of ritual that was taking place and they would just begin to utter words and lose sight of it? I can remember growing up uh, uh, reciting the Apostles' Creed all the time. And you just begin to realize that you can recite that, but boy, when you stop to reflect upon it, that, that, that 
creed should change and transform us as, we, as you stop to think about. But oftentimes what happens is we just get caught up in the memorization and just saying it without simply reflecting upon it. And then he adds this idea of, of, of a dream that comes with bi- much business. And there's kind of, you know, wondering what does that specifically mean. What I came up with is that it's simply, it may be a, a, a preoccupation with, one, with one's own affairs. And you, when you think about it, as we come into God's presence, especially in a, in a, a time of worship like this, it's very specific, where is our mind? Is it thinking about, I got to mow the yard later, uh, I've got to go fishing at five, I got to play some golf, I got to, uh, uh, you know, and so what can happen is, is all of a sudden we're, we're distracted and our heart, our mind is not completely here. And then when you think about a fool's voice with many words, again, uh, fools, many words it could be simply an indication of someone, again, who's simply preoccupied with themselves. And oftentimes, if you meet a fool, you find out that that's where they're at. But again, reflecting upon that idea of what was Jesus, what, where, the, the, the passage that came to my mind and uh, was, in, was incurred on, spurred on by another person who indicated the same thing is in Luke 18, 9 through 14. If you'd like to go there real quick, you could. Luke 18, 9 through 14. Or again, you wonder again, is Jesus, is this passage in, in Ecclesiastes, is it on his mind as he's teaching this story? In Luke chapter 18, verse 9, he says, He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus goes on, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. We have one of many words. Most of those words were about himself and how thankful God should be that he's there and that uh, he's in God's presence. The other one simply acknowledged that I don't deserve your presence. Would you show me forgiveness? And so, as we come into, as we engage in worship, as we pray, let us let us let us be careful in how we how we even pray and what we are praying. And then, the second point area that he uh, offers critique is with vowels, v o w s, not the letters vowels. That could be my accent. I don't know. So. when you vow a vow to God, do not delay paying it, for He has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow that, that, than that you should vow and not pay. Let not your mouth lead you into sin. Do not say before the messenger that it is a mistake. Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? So we are not to vow rashly. In Deuteronomy 23, verses 21 through 23, it says, If you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay fulfilling it. For the Lord your God will surely require it of you, and you will be guilty of sin. But if you refrain from vowing, you will not be guilty of sin. You shall be careful to do what has passed your lips, for you have voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God what you have promised with your mouth. So it's interesting. um, In in my study, they, 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 they say that tied to temple worship, a vow was a promise to consecrate something normally, either a sacrifice or a money payment to God in return for granting a favor. Vowing was voluntary, but failure to fulfill a vow once made was then not to do it, not to to honor that vow was offensive to God. And so it's kind of it's kind of an interesting thing. And, and, and you know, and some of us, I don't know if you've ever made a vow in your life where you're like, God, if I'll 
I, you know, you hear those vows, God, I'll serve you if you save me from this. I, I think of the story of Louis Zamperini in, in Unbroken and how he made that vow out there out floating around in a, 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 a flotation boat after uh, being shot down, or after, actually I think his plane just crashed, it was in bad shape, but he made a vow that he would serve God if he got out of that. Well, you know, there's a lot of time more on the water and then a concentration camp uh, under the Japanese and then back to the States, but it was in a Billy Graham uh, crusade where that came to his mind, and he was confronted with it, and he, he responded to it. So, hasty, unfulfilled vows are another example of foolish worship, for they demonstrate a lack of respect for God and bring judgment down on the worshiper. And in this case, God, spared, God allowed, God brought it back to mind in, in Louis' life, and he responded to that. But I think of another example. I can remember uh, back in late college days and went to, uh, uh, to speak at a, at a youth uh, uh, weekend, and I was not the main speaker. There was another speaker named Walt. Walt had an incredible testimony. He had been working somewhere in a job and fell, I don't know how many, uh, how many stories, on the way down, hit the wrecking ball, uh, which slowed him down. But then he continued to descend, and by the time he hit the ground, uh, he was still alive. His chest had been crushed. His face was, was a mess. He was um, uh, begging the guys to lift him up because he couldn't breathe laying flat. So they were able to prop him up enough where he could breathe, and uh, they eventually rushed him to the hospital. The guy experienced miracles, uh, his, his story. He, he watched his chest uh, come back. Uh, the, 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 the ribs rehealed in, in his midst. I mean, he freaked out the nurse. The nurse didn't know what to do with it. I mean, it was a story of when he walked in and walked out, it had such an impact on the nurse and the doctors. It was, it was incredible. But what was interesting about Walt, he shared a story about a woman that had made a vow. And her vow was that if God would heal her, that she would do this. And he knew about it. He heard her make the vow. But then she didn't honor the vow. And one day he came across her path and he said, you, you made a vow to God. And now that you've been healed, you've moved on and you've, you're not, God will you need to be very careful. Well, she did. She, she, God did bring uh, judgment upon that, that vow. There, it was an offense. And she eventually then died, not too long after that. So, again, we have to be careful. And I think it goes back again. It goes back to, have we grown casual with the holy and righteous God. Yes, we hear all about His love, and He is. He's full of love. It's a holy love. But have we grown casual in our worship, in our walks? Where's our mind? Where's our mouth? Are we careful in how we pray and what we pray? God is holy. And yeah, you could say, well, that's Old Testament. Well, I think, again, it's, there's something there is that if you're going to make some kind of commitment to God, if you're going to make a, some kind of vow, He's going to look for you to honor that. And it's an offense. It's, it's, it's really what we're doing is we're, we're seeking to manipulate God. So we need not be hasty nor impulsive. And you know that whole idea of manipulation? I... At times when I pray, I sense the Holy Spirit kind of putting a check at times. And I have to simply, God, I see how this, how, I could see how this could come across as manipulative. And you know, and you know my heart. And you know, and I know my heart. I know my heart can be deceitfully wicked. I know that. And yet, Lord, I'm going to just simply get it out there and just acknowledge that I can see how I could be trying to manipulate you. But I, right now, here and now, I just want to acknowledge that you are God and I am not. And so if you are willing to do this, thank you. If not, I'll still praise you. But I don't want to be about trying to manipulate you because you can't be manipulated. 
And so again, it goes back to as we engage God in worship, as we are engaging Him in worship, where is our heart? Is there humility there? Are we trying to manipulate? Asking the Holy Spirit to keep our motives in check. And so, properly entering into worship, properly engaging in worship, and then third, properly exiting worship. And that leads us to our last verse. For when dreams increase and words grow many, there is vanity. But God is the one you must fear. Again, I go back to that passage in Matthew 15 or Isaiah 23, for when dreams increase and words grow many, there is vanity. But that idea is that, where is my heart? Am I worshiping you in vain? And what it does, what, what we really see is that throughout, the, I mean, the, throughout these seven verses, you know, what, how he concludes it all is that what, if taken seriously, what negates arrogance and careless, carelessness is simply fearing God. Which is really the conclusion of the book. He's calling us to walk in a fear, in an appropriate fear of God. What Jerry Bridges in his book, the, fearing, the, the, the Joy of Fearing God, he calls the healthy tension. He says this, he says, there should always be a healthy tension between the confidence with which we come before God as His children and the reverential awe with which we behold Him as our sovereign Lord. I don't know about you, but I, I experience that tension a lot. Because I, I, I know His love, the love that He's demonstrated toward me in that while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. I, I seek to, to preach the gospel to myself daily and give thanks, and there's gratitude in that in light of what he's done and accomplished, but there's still that sense he is sovereign Lord. He is God, I am not. And I see throughout Scripture, I through, see throughout lives in which there are things that take place. I don't understand it all, but I simply have got to submit myself to it, even when it's difficult. There's a difference between holy and unholy familiarity with God. We have indeed received the spirit of adoption, the spirit by whom we cry, Abba, Father, and we give thanks for that. This expression conveys the warmth and confidence, confidence with which we may come into His presence. At the same time, we should remember that this one whom we're invited to address as Father is still the sovereign and holy God. He is still the king who is eternal, immortal, and invisible, and who lives in an unapproachable light whom no one has seen or can see. So if you think about it, in reality, the theme that runs through these, first, these seven verses is the fear of God. The fear of God should have an influence on how we approach Him with re respect and reverence. It should also have an effect on how we worship. Have we become too casual or maybe even lazy in our worship? When we leave, do we do so with an attitude, I'm glad that's over with, I can now check that off and move on to, the, to real living? Or do we leave knowing that worship hasn't really ceased because I am leaving a building, but as a continuation as I step out to continue to honor God with my thoughts, my words, and how I live my life. Let not our worship be in vain. Let not our condition be worse off when we leave than when we came in. And that makes me, that causes me to reflect upon a story that I read a number of years ago. William Law, he was, um, he was of the 18th century, and he wrote a book um, called A Serious Call to a Devout and Holy Life. I don't think I've shared this story before. But he tells the story of penitents. And he goes on, he says, Penitens was a busy, notable, and prosperous tradesman who was dying in his 35th year. A little before his death, when the doctors had given him over, some of the neighbors came one evening to see him, and he spoke this to them. He says, my friends, when you consider that I have lived free from scandal 
And in the communion of the church, you perhaps wonder, wonder to see me so full of remorse and self-condemnation as, as, the, as I approach death. But alas, what a poor thing it is to have lived only free from murder, theft, and adultery, which is all that I can say of myself. Sounds like the Pharisee. It is true that I have lived in the communion of the church and generally frequented its worship and service on Sundays when I was neither too idle nor otherwise occupied with my business and pleasures. But my conformity to the public worship has been more a matter of course than a real intention of doing what the church requires. Had that not been so, I would have been an oftener, I would have been an oftener at church, more devout when there, and more fearful of neglecting it. Hmm. Sounds like our three points. But the thing that now surprises me most is this that I never intended to live up to the gospel. This never so much as entered my head or heart. I never once considered whether I was living as the laws of religion direct or whether my way of life was such as would procure me the mercy of God at this hour. What is the reason that I, who have so often talked of the necessity of rules, methods, and diligence in worldly business, have all this while never once thought of any rules, methods, or managements to carry me on in a life of devotion. Had I only my frailties and imperfections to lament at this time, I should, hear humbly tr- I should lie here humbly trusting in the mercies of God. But alas, how can I call a general disregard and a thorough neglect of all religious improvement a frailty or imperfection when it was in my power to have been as and as many helps, have practiced as many rules, and have been taught as many methods of holy living as thriving in my shop, had I but so intended and desired it. Penitence was here going on, but his mouth was stopped by a convulsion which never permitted him to speak anymore. What penitence is being confronted with is the reality that, that these years of his living within the communion as a church, as he called it, he never entered into it properly. He never engaged it properly. And it's evident he never exited it properly. You could say that when he went into worship, he left in worse condition, kind of like the Pharisee. He left in worse condition than when he entered. And so what, would, and so what you could say is that his worship was in vain. And he's being confronted with that reality at, that, at this moment. I think one of the things that we need to be reminded is that, is that we have not been called into religion. We've not been called into man's approach to somehow manipulate God or bribe God to get me to heaven. We've been called to a relationship, a relationship with this loving and holy, righteous God. And that's... That's something that should indeed continue to change and transform us. It's kind of like oftentimes we need to stop thinking as worship as something that's from, from the ground up, but the fact that when I enter into worship, it's from the top down, and that God is wanting to change and transform us as we enter in, as we engage, and as we exit. He's wanting to change and transform our lives. And so we need to check our hearts to make sure we are properly entering into, engaging in, and exiting worship properly. Let's pray. Lord, it's my hope that each and every one of us has entered into this time this morning in a proper way. Lord, that our hearts, our minds, our mouths have, have, have been here and, and, and that they've been in submission to, to you. Lord, if, if for some reason we haven't come in that way, I pray, Lord, that, that now would be a time for our hearts and minds and mouths to simply be submitted to you. Lord, that we not leave here today with a a, a casual or flippant attitude. But Lord, that we would leave here today with a proper fear and respect, a reverence for who you are 
and simply a reverence for what you've done and what you've accomplished for us. And Lord, that it would fill our hearts with gratitude and with joy. Lord, that we do, that we are in a relationship with you. The God who has loved us, demonstrated that love, and yet who is holy and his king. And so, Lord, I pray that our hearts and minds would indeed be submitted to you today and that you'd have your way within us. And, Lord, that throughout this week and each and every day, Lord, that we would know what it is to worship you and glorify you. We thank you, Lord Jesus, and we pray these things, Lord Jesus, in your precious name. Amen.